to the Word. Is that fun? Like it. So, will you open your Bibles? And so today you're going to need to follow um, quite closely because not all the text is going to be up there. And it would be quite cool as we read the verses. You might see, you, you're going to be able to go back to what we, what we are reading. And, and it will be good to also learn the habit of following along in the text. So John 6, verse 26, key scripture for today. Ek gaan net hierdie tafel bykie omskuif. Ek sal my gaan help en makes me feel a little claustrophobic. Okay. It's in the square. Um, so, John 6, 26 to 35. Are you ready? Okay, read with me. Jesus answered them. You can read with me. Truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him God the Father has set his seal. Okay, you can stop there. Then they said to him, What must we do to be doing the works of God? And Jesus answered them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he sent. So they said to him, Then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Our fathers ate manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Just then, sorry, Jesus then said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks. Praise be to God. Thanks be to God. Okay, so can we all say, thanks be to God. Okay, awesome. Thank you, Lord, for your word. That's all we're saying, okay? It also means that we can end scripture and get into some other stuff. Okay, so in the 1930s, there was this dude, um, and Simon, can you, can you show us his mug? His name um, was William Somerset. Say, try to say his surname with me. Morgham. Okay, Morgham. And Morgham, Morgham, okay? And uh, he was famous for a few novels, so this is like the, the 30s era, and plays and short stories. This dude was very notable for his work such as uh, Of Human Bondage and The Constant Wife, which saw numerous, that's like such a weird title, don't you think? I don't even know what the book's about. The con- Yes, once you're married, you're married. That's true. Um, and it's awesome. And which which saw numerous successful performances. So this dude was like really renowned. Think about like maybe the the household name of the day, right? So everyone knows who Elon Musk is, for an example. Let's think about in the 30s, it was this dude, right? Because people had different interests, not electric cars. Okay, so the real question uh, was about how Morgan felt about his success. So answers came through an article. So this question that I had was, how did this dude feel about his success? And Robin Morgan, his nephew, sort of wrote an article about his uncle. And I summarized it. So I've condensed it quite a bit because otherwise we're going to be here for too long. And so he visited his uncle's opulent sort of Mediterranean villa, right? This guy um, is now 91. He is, all the royalties are cruising in. He hasn't done any writing for a while. He's made it, okay? He is, by all worldly standards and measures, very, very, very successful. Even his 7,000 pound house or euro house that he initially, sorry, euro, euro house that he initially bought is now worth 600,000 euros. Bear in mind, this is like 1965 somewhere, right? Okay, and so this dude has like 11 servants. He has his own personal chef, which is like the town envy because apparently she makes the best course around, right? And uh, despite this luxury, something had changed for this man. So at 91, he's sitting there um, with a Bible, and Robin accounts of the story. He's sitting there with a Bible, looking weary, lying on his couch, probably that same couch, I would think. 
and confessing that he is haunted by a childhood Bible verse, right? A childhood biblical quote, this verse that was up against his wall growing up, but that he never really wrestled with. It was just the saying that he was so familiar with. What shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? And despite this missing it, the sentiment, the sentiment lingered, affecting his perceived success. So he's sitting there and he's going, whoa, what does this mean? What, this thing it keeps coming up with me. What shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world but lose his own soul? Okay? And that evening, in his drawing room, Morgan drops, he's dropped the accomplishment act. Something has clicked. Something moved into his heart, and I think he's, he's gripped, he came to grips with what this, this quote or this biblical quote of Scripture is saying. He admits, finally, after 91 years, exhaustion, a lifetime of mistakes, and regret over his writing. He says, I wish I'd never written a single word. And as night fell, a disturbing scene unfolded. Morgan, gripped by fear, age 91, Denied an unseen presence, desperately proclaiming, I'm not ready. I'm not dead yet. This old man's freaking out on a couch going, I'm not ready. I'm not dead yet. Fear stricken, his voice terrified, echoing through this empty room. And it revealed a man haunted by the hidden costs of his visible successes. So he came to the end of his life. And maybe you've heard the story in a different way. He came to the end of his life and he realized that none of this, none of this stuff really matters. Right? So he has, he has, he's haunted by the intangible costs of, a tan, of tangible success. Right? So the things, the money, the house, all the, the worldly success, the material success haunts him because it's cost him something other than money. Yeah? Are you tracking? Okay, cool. So there's our story for today. And so this dude in the 30s, a rock star, right, has it all. Fame, fortune. He's uh, doing the VIP dinners. And yet, when the encore came, when it came time for his grand finale, it felt like an empty melody. The thought of a final curtain call was just downright chilling to this man. Life's meant to be a grand adventure, not a wild goose chase, right? And so enter Jesus, the ultimate liberator, pulling us from the abyss of life's emptiness. He unfolds the bread of life discourse in this passage. So in John 6, there's an invitation. Jesus is on a cosmic, like, universal rescue mission, okay? And he's introducing us to the Father who's the ultimate provider. Okay, so Jesus, with his discourse here in John 6, is actually inviting us into something that is life beyond this life, and that is life not only for then, but for now as well. Yeah? Okay. So let's dive into the text. Jesus is, in John 6, is basically dropping, he's busy dropping truth bombs, right? Truly, truly. Yeah? He's, he's really, really, uh, and we'll look at it now, quite confrontational with what he has to say to the crowds that follow him. And he's making them realize, hey guys, he's, he's through this text, and I'm just trying to frame what we're going to be looking at. He's actually making them realize, hey guys, you guys are running on empty. And so once they get that memo, he then goes on to spill the secrets. So he tells them, listen... There's not much left in your tank. Like the things you th- think you can rely on, those things, they are but vapor. Hevel, right, in the words of Ecclesiastes. And then he goes on to say, this is where you can find something of real sustenance. Right, there's an invitation through this text. It's almost like this grand picnic. Jesus is inviting them into sitting down with him and, and actually having a mind-altering moment, right? Like a... A moment where he, he is, 
they are able to see things in a way that they have never seen things before. Okay, and so my hope that the hope for this, for us, for this, for this, for us, for us through this, is that what 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 the text will do this evening is actually open up maybe a, a perspective on on what Jesus is saying when he's saying I'm the bread of life. What is he actually declaring? Um, not according to me, but according to Scripture, right? And so he's he's inviting us out of, and sorry for the fans here, but uh, that, that sort of wimpy menu life, right? So this is the best I was thinking. Like, it's a bit bland. They haven't changed the menu for, so some people love it. In my opinion, it's, it, it needs a bit of revamping, right? Okay, I haven't eaten there in a while. But, but it's, sometimes I feel like it's different foods, different rest, there can be, a, bl- there can be a, a repetitive taste to that food. So sometimes we go back to that for the same reason over and over again, because we actually like that, how that tastes. We're satisfied, we've, we've become familiar with that taste. And sometimes that, we, we perceive that to be the only option. That's what I'm trying to say here, yeah? Okay. And so here's the thing. Jesus himself, sort of like this Morgan dude, is actually the rock star of his era. Okay, and I mean this not disrespectfully. Jesus was the main man in, in that there was no one more popular than Jesus in this moment, right? Drawing crowds of people. Jesus is a crowd magnet, in fact. Literally, wherever he goes, the crowd follows. We see this all over the New Testament. The disciples, I'm sensing, are maybe a little bit tired at this point in text. Maybe a bit burnt out, potentially from the chaos. Remember, they've been like following Jesus. There's been a whole bunch of movement. Um, they've just got a boat ticket, a boat ticket, a boat ticket, right? Jesus has said, "Go and chill in beside her." But surprise, this crowd then again, leading up to this text, follows them again, and Jesus blows me away because he doesn't respond like other superstars or or rock stars do. Jesus doesn't blow off the paparazzi and the crowd and go like, no, 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 not today. Dark glasses on, hoodie. (laughs) Jesus engages again. He gives of himself again, and he goes into full-on ministry mode again, right? And so this, this whole thing, this whole sort of moment climaxes or finds its point in the feeding of the 5,000, right? It sort of all builds up to him replicating the bread, multiplying the bread and the fish. Okay, we're familiar with that story. Okay. But can you imagine how the disciples are feeling at this moment? Can you imagine what it was like to follow Jesus around? No, I only do what I see the Father doing. The Father says, Capernaum. The Father says, Bethsaida. Right? And then the disciples follow. And so come nightfall, Jesus actually sends them, remember, on a, another boat adventure. And he throws in a storm and some walking on water, uh, water for good measure. And, and so finally, the guys get to the other side thinking that they've finally dodged the crowd. Okay, they've been trying to, Jesus is now superstar famous. They're trying to just get to a place where they can rest, where he can breathe. Jesus keeps ministering every time that they think they escape. People find him again, and then they want more things from him. And then he generously meets them with himself. Okay, and so, unfortunately, they get to the other side. They think they've dodged the crowd. This time we've got it, and the crowd had boats, which meant that the crowd followed, right? And they made the crossing with the disciples, with Jesus, to Capernaum, and so that's sort of where we pick up. Are you with me? Okay. The next day, they casually asked Jesus when he arrived, as if like, as if they had no business, like Jesus had no business giving them the slip. So the next day, they asked him like, oh, so when did you get here? We know they know that Jesus is uh, looking to rest, but they're after something. 
Why were they chasing Jesus? I would argue, not for the deep talks or the beautiful sermons, but for potentially for material goodies. Right, if, if you've just seen a man make bread out of thin air and fish out of thin air, right? we said people, last week we looked at it, we said people are radically drawn to the supernatural. But not always for the right reasons, right? Often because of what the supernatural can give them. And so a similar thing is happening here. The crowds flock towards the supernatural and they pursue the spiritual only for how it might materially benefit them. And so, same here. That's what's happening. They really fancy this guy who made bread and fish from thin air. This is like, remember, like bread and fish was like a really solid meal. That's like, that was like really nice food at that time. If you could have bread and fish, that's like a really holistic protein carbs, you're good, right? Okay, and so this is the ultimate material satisfaction of the time. They're there because of their stomachs. Little did they know that the same bread magician could actually cater for their deep spiritual longings. And not only their deep spiritual longings, the deepest longings and desires of their hearts. Okay, so God's gracious in that Jesus meets us often when we ask Him for stuff and want things from Him. He meets us there. But he doesn't give us all the stuff and things. He actually gives us what we actually desire, what we truly, truly want, right? That which lies deep beneath the surface of our lives, which we aren't always so super aware of. So Jesus is very generous, and he's wise. So he shifts their focus, right, from the material, from the bread and the fish miracle that's just happened, through this text. I'm still framing John 6, right? And... He moves them beyond the lusts of their flesh towards those deeper longings and desires. Yeah? Okay, Moy. So that frames some of what we're going to read today. So we're going to walk through it in two scenes. Yeah? Scene one, receiving the Father's provision. Okay, so that will be from verse 26 to 35. And then the portion of text we didn't read but will read, scene two, verse 53 to 58 delighting in the Father's provision. So first of all, receiving the Father's provision. And then second of all, delighting in the Father's provision. Okay, this will make a bit more sense in a second. So scene one, Jesus confronts the crowd, verse 26. So you can go back to the beginning of our reading if you have your Bible open. He, he confronts them and he disrupts their unconsidered following. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Jesus is confrontational right off the bat. He knows, he knows, he discerns the heart of man. He sees what they're actually after. And Jesus doesn't shy away like many of us do today. He speaks up. In other words, Jesus is saying something to the effect of, you seek me only because you want full stomachs, because you are materially motivated by the things of this world. How many of us follow Jesus because we perceive that he makes things comfortable, soothing, or pleasant? We think him an indulgent savior. But he knew that that was definitely not why he had come. And so Jesus continues. Verse 27. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that, has, that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For, only, sorry, for on him God the Father has set his seal. Okay, so Jesus disrupts. Within two lines, right? Two or three lines. He addresses their heart's disposition, which is flawed. And then he points them immediately to that which they actually long for. Are you seeing that? The true bread. 
Yeah? True food, but for the food that endures to eternal life. And so with this statement, he reveals something. He reveals the spiritual realities he urgently wanted people to see. I don't think it was ever Jesus' heart through the miracles, the healings, the multiplication of the bread for people to come to know him as a blesser. He's saying here, there are spiritual realities. He's, being, he's actually quite urgent. He's saying, guys, you're missing it. You're following me here. You're, you're, this is unconsidered following. This is dangerous territory. So there are two kinds of bread Jesus is talking about here. One, a material bread that perishes. You can go to that slide. A material bread that perishes. And two, a spiritual bread that lives eternally. Okay. <laughs> I couldn't find a quail, so I just turned him on his side. Okay, so, so it's a dead quail, guys. Okay, he's not just sleeping. Okay. But think, just look at that quickly for a second. A material bread that perishes, these things rot, they decay. In fact, in the time of the Israelite nation, or the Jews, after Exodus, within a day, that stuff was really bad to eat. Okay? You can imagine also, it's, I think one supernatural, but two desert. Like how well do you think things keep in a desert if they don't keep a week in our fridges? Right? And then two, a spiritual bread. He's speaking, he's saying there's a bread that you don't know about. There's a bread that you actually hunger and long for that I want to talk to you about. He's saying that is why you've actually come. And he points out the desires, the deeper drives, the deeper motives of their hearts. And so we all know groceries perish, right? I can remember many times when my dad would come home, food lovers, or we had fruit and veg back then. Do you guys remember fruit and veg? That was a good time. Sundays after church, some of us, yes, amen. And my dad would come home with a box of groceries, right? And by nightfall, my brother and my sister and I are like, oh, breathe, there's nothing in the house. Yeah? There's nothing. Like, where's... Why? Because we'd eaten everything, right? Everything had perished in the afternoon. The grapes had come home. The grapes were gone. Ask Danny. I still do it, unfortunately. It's like she goes shopping. She knows. She buys an extra thing of, of nectarines because they will get smashed within a day and a half. It's, I like them a lot. Okay. And so we complain. They, these things perish, and there's a complaining that there was nothing to eat. So Jesus... He's actually making the important statement. He's reminding the crowd that we earn physical bread or physical food by the sweat of our brow, right? But spiritual food is eternal life, is of something eternal. There's a different way in which we require, acquire spiritual food, yeah? And so that food does not come from our work, but it comes from Christ alone. He's saying, yeah, he says in the scripture, he says, but the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. Right, that is food that comes without a cost. Well, not, not without a cost, but not in the way that we are used to at coming. Correct. Yeah. And so in these verses, Jesus begins to elevate. He, he's slowly drawing their attention, right? He's, he's just saying, guys, come on. Like, just think, like, just stop for a moment. You're rushing, sheep after sheep, right? Everyone's just going. Why? Because the crowd's going. We spoke about that last week as well. You, this is unconsidered. Think about this for a second. What are you actually, what are you after? What are you after? And so... He, he's, he's speaking to our defective view, a defective view of what life is actually all about, right? That's the whole reason Jesus needed to come, because for years, for, for generations, God had spoken through the prophets. He said to them, guys, this is not how things are meant to be. Rather do it like this. This is not how I define reality. Rather live your lives out like this. And no, we could not. We could not in our own capacity, we could not by our own smarts or our own uh, uh, free will make it happen. 
And so God generously sent us Jesus. Why? To come and draw our eyes, our gaze, our focus to a greater eternity, to a greater reality, to the true reality, not another reality, to how things truly are in the kingdom of heaven. Yeah? Amen. So we see this exchange, it continues in verse 28 and 29. 28, so you can read in your Bibles, it's very good practice. Then they said to him, what must we do to be doing the works of God? So do you see, we can pause there, do you see, and I'm only seeing this now as, as I'm reading through it for the f- however many of time. They immediately equate material bread with the need to work. Do you see how the human mind, like Jesus is saying, well, guys, stop, look at this for a moment. And then he says, this is not about something that you can do, but something that is given freely. And immediately their response is, what must we do to be doing the works of God? (laughs) Don't you feel like we do that? And so Jesus answers them generously. He says, this is the work of God. Saying, do you really want to know? Do you want to know what the work of God is? He says, that you believe in him who he sent. That is the work of God. Do you know what you can do because you're so burning to do something, because you think that that's what it's all about, doing? Believe rather in Jesus. Believe rather in the one whom he sent, right? So Jesus is actually referring to himself. They're not catching. So it's like, guys are glitching here, right? There's not, there isn't a clear line from point A to point B. The men in, in specifically are struggling here, right? Because they want the straight line. Okay? And they ask Jesus what kind of work they had to do to get the bread they thought they needed. So now they're like, oh, cool. Okay, spiritual bread. We're so down for that. Like, that sounds like, huh? But now what do we have to do to get that one? It's like you gave the other one for Mahala. That was lacquer. God, you blessed us with that. But now you're saying there's another bread. How do we get it? What can we do, Jesus? What Rabbi, tell us. What can we do? We just want to, just tell us. And Jesus is too wise. And instead he says, do you know what you can do? You can believe in the one that he sent, that in whom he sent. In whom he sent. Believe the one whom he sent. Rather do that. Okay. So they asked him what kind of work they had to do. And... Uh, He's saying there's no physical work needed here. There's nothing you can do. That is the, uh, but that in fact it is a matter of faith. That it is a matter of believing in Jesus. Okay, now what belief and faith pertains to, we don't have the time to necessarily journey into because I think some of us have misperceptions around what it means to believe. But to put your faith, your trust in Jesus, we can, all, we can all understand what that means, right? So he's saying clearly and plainly, do not put your trust in your own works or in the works that you can produce for yourself, but put rather your trust in Jesus, in the one whom God sent. The bread that endures comes through faith, not works. Yeah? Okay. Okay. Imagine you've, you've, so here we go, we're going to imagine. It's good to imagine, get the creative juices flowing. Think about a family that you love, some family, right, that's in your life. Not, maybe not your family, you should hopefully you love your family. But think about another family, a family that's dear to your heart, that you, you've maybe had for dinner in the past. And now imagine them coming, you're welcome to close your eyes if you want to see them, please do. Imagine they... It's now, you've had a wonderful church service, maybe on a Sunday morning, or in our case, a Sunday evening, and you've planned to have a braai with them afterwards. And so, it's, it's Sunday evening dinner, you're braaiing, right? And you are, it's a great meal, okay? You've, you've, like, you've gone the extra mile. You know these people, you love them, you know what they like, you've put down a lag of spread. All the good things that they schmark, you've got there, you've bought the woolies, this and that, okay? And... You cook their favorite meal just as they like it. 
And then there's this beautiful, big, colorful, just imagine, like imagine it, just picture it in your mind. A big, beautiful, colorful tossed salad, right? The ones like Danny makes, beautiful, wonderful, pomegranates, like a rocket, bit of feta cheese, some baked potatoes with cheese sauce on the side, cold drink with ice, right? Like all the very good, imagine some cold drink with ice right now. That's like, <laughs> yo, can we get some ice up in here? And then to top it off, you've got malva. Right? Like, yo, you've got the South African staple. It's there. It's at the table. And what a dinner. Okay, you can open your eyes. What a dinner. Does that sound like a lucky dinner? Okay, you see how your stomachs are already like, <gasps> yeah, it doesn't take much. So, soon everyone, we're sticking with the dinner, dinner, dinner picture. Everyone, I'm afraid of the magis. Everyone's happy. They're sitting there. Tummies are full. And uh, the time comes for your guests to leave. It's normal. Like, got to go home now, right? And uh, suddenly, they sort of, oh, do you have a phone nearby? Donkey. They whip out their phones, out the back pocket, and they go, oh, so uh, do, you, do you have Snapscan? <laughs> or do you do e-wallet? Look, what do you, you want to do? And uh, they insinuate something. And you think you definitely say, you don't owe me anything, right? Like, like your response is like, what are, you, what are you doing? You don't owe me anything. This is weird. Why are you friend that I really love? We know each other. Why? And uh, their response is simply, but we most certainly do. We definitely do owe you for the willies whatever. We are not freeloaders, right? How much do we owe you? And then they even open up like their physical wallets. The leather, it's a piece of leather, for those of us who don't know, it's a piece of leather that opens up like this, and it's got like cards in it that you can actually swipe. You don't actually just tap them. You can swipe those things, okay? And, uh, and then, so they whip this guy out, and then they start throwing these blue buffaloes your way. They saw me just, Yeah? Okay, very funny. But this is, but I mean, I, I, look at, I look at this picture, right? And I think this is something of what we must look to Jesus. Jesus offers us his best. God offers us his best in Jesus. The best meal we could ever have. That which sustains us. That which feeds us. That which meets us in our deepest longings and desires. Jesus gives us freely. In himself. The Father the Father, right? We're speaking about the Father provides today. And the Father provides in fullness. Maybe you have a dad or an uncle or a father in your life that just cannot help himself but put on that kind of spread when it's time to have everyone over. Or at least that is his heart's deepest desire if he can't do that. Right? And so the Father generously gives us Jesus. He goes, out of, he goes literally out of his way to give us all that we could want And if you, if you just put yourself in that position, now maybe just in the, in the shoes of, of the Lord for a second, right? It's, it's very metaphorical. Wouldn't that be almost insulting to you? How would that make you feel? If, if you, you, the people that you love, who you really, really know, you love, you, you've journeyed with them, suddenly they're throwing money at you. As if what you've given them is another commodity. And so we find ourselves going through life trying to pay for a free meal. And in the process, we insult God. We insult the Lord. Not intentionally, but we... Are you catching what I'm saying? Okay. Okay. So as Jesus says, so then he carries on. So verse 29, back to the Bibles. Donkey, thank you, Anal, with the slides. I really appreciate the jumping around. You're so good at that. At Jesus says in verse, he says this in verse 29, this is the work of God that you believed in him who he has sent. In other words, the bread that endures eternal life is the bread that is freely given and that we can freely receive. 
It comes not from our own doing, but the doing of God. I'm, that sounds a little bit repetitive, but I need you to get the point. Danny's like, yes, dude, you've said that already. It is for freedom's sake that we have been set free. So why are we attaching a value of our own to the work of the divine? Why do we get to put a label or a value on a finished work of God? Why do we treat Jesus like a commodity? And unfortunately, it's the case of crowds. It's the case of these people here in this text. They're not catching on, right? And so when we follow blindly, we actually what happens is we, we become comfortable with the discernment of the collective. We start to believe that the right thing, or what it means to do the right thing or to participate in the right way, is whatever everyone else does. And sometimes we end up missing what is obvious and really is right in front of us. So instead of considering what the Lord is saying and seeking and genuinely seeking to understand these profound truths, the people divert and test Jesus instead. They, they click over and they go, like, what's okay, so what must we do? It's like this classic case of listening to respond and not listening to understand. We all do this, and it's mainly because we all think we know what's best, and we all want to be the best, and we want to have the answers, and I just, I know, like when Danny and I miscommunicate, it's definitely because we think we know best, and the truth is, what we're realizing over and over is that actually, we really don't. We really don't know what's best. We don't know what's best for us. We actually don't know what's best for one another. Like we really want to try hard and love each other well, but actually only God knows what we need and only God can give us a sufficient meal for our hunger. Amen. Okay. And so Jesus is not really interested in all of that. And they ask him, they sort of ask him, they say, so, so they say to him, then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? They test him. What work do you perform, Jesus? Our fathers, check this, our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. They are telling God his own story. Can you believe it? Don't we do this with the Lord? Our oh Lord, but... You know, you said, he's like, yeah, I, I know I said, I said it. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Or Jesus, something like Jesus, we're not really all interested in all of that. You did a great sign yesterday, that was lacquer, like you fed 5,000 people. But actually, we now want you to come and do a kind of miracle that's sort of on par with Moses. Right, like we want to see chicken and bread rain from the sky. Like, do that, Jesus. This is, this is something of what they're saying. So when I say they were disrespectful or that they, they undermined here, I re it's, that's what I really mean. They say, oh, but Moses fed them Israel for, they, he fed them six days a week. For 40 years. And Jesus stands there and he goes, I know. I fed them. My father fed them. Okay? And so and to understand what they were saying and why, we must just consider quickly Exodus 16. So, flip to your Bibles. Flip your Bibles. Go. All the way back to the second book of the Bible. So, Genesis, Exodus Exodus 16, I'm going to give you a second to get there. If you only have a digital Bible, use your thumb fast. Okay. Exodus 16 verse 1. Is everyone there? Just say, yep. Cool. Verse 1 to 4. They set out from Elam 
And all the congregation of the people of Israel came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elim and Sinai, on the 15th day of the second month after they had departed the land of Egypt. So just be aware, this is post their exit of Egypt, Exodus, and And the whole congregation of the people of Israel grumbled. Look at how they treat Moses. <laughs> they grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the people of Israel, Israel said to them, would that, would that we have, had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the meat pots and ate bread to the full? For you have brought us out into the wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. This is something of how they treat Moses. The guy, the, so Jesus is in some way the new Moses. Are we tracking here? Jesus is the gift of God, the liberate, the great liberator. Moses was God's chosen person to come and liberate the Israelite nation from Egypt. Look at how they treat Moses. God's elect, God, well, God's anointed, right? The one who God chose to help free them. This is how they treat him. And so, then they said, then, then the Lord, the Lord said to Moses, behold, and I just, I just sense the Father so patient in this moment, like, sure guys, I just literally closed an ocean behind you on guys that wanted to kill you. I actually gave you much of the wealth of Egypt, you carried it out with you. And this is, okay, but you know what, Moses, I'm going to rain bread from heaven for you and for the people, and they shall go and gather a day's portion every day that I may test them, whether they will walk in my law or not. Isn't this cool how this text is coming alive, right? Verse 11 to 15, further down, and the Lord said to Moses, I have heard the grumbling of the people of Israel. Say to them, at twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall be filled with bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. So God is saying, I want you to know me in my provision. When you see the ground littered with manna, which directly translated actually means, what is this or what is it? Because they didn't know. It's like, imagine just this white edible stuff just pops up all over, all over the floor. And, next to, and then, then the other end of the day, there's just like the equivalent of KFC, just like KFC buckets all over the desert. Okay? Really? In the evening, quail came and covered the camp. And in the morning, dew lay around the camp. And when the dew had gone up, there was on the face of the wilderness a fine flake-like thing, a fine flake-like thing, fine as frost on the ground. And when the people of Israel saw it, they said to one another, what is it? What is it? For they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, it is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. What is it? It's a similar question that they're asking you. What is this bread that you speak of, Jesus? What is it? He says something from heaven. But something greater than manna on the ground. A gift from the Father. Me is what Jesus is saying. He's saying, guys, I am the bread of life. Are you seeing this discourse? Oof, okay. And so close your eyes just for a moment. We're going to do some more imagining. Yes. So imagine you're in a tent. The sun is sort of, sun's coming up, and it's starting to warm things, like that somewhat cold from the night air still lingering around, but it's also starting to slowly get warm as the sun edges over the desert horizon. But this morning, something is different. It's not the normal or the usual quiet campsite. There's a buzz. There's, there's conversation outside of the tents. As people all around the camp are asking themselves and asking one another, what is it? What is it? What is it? What is this? 
Your neighbor, Neshrim, speaks to his daughter, Tabitha, and he says, gather some of this white stuff. You know the, the, the what you call it. And she says, sure, but what is it, Father? And we know that this happened because of Exodus, so you can open up your eyes. We know that this happened because Exodus 16 verse 31 says, Now the house of Israel called its name manna, right? Which means, what is it? I'm being a little bit repetitive. So for the next 40 years, six days a week, every morning the Jews ate, what is it? That's what they ate. What is the spiritual bread? So this idea running through the back of the mind, this is literally... Now, if you're a Jew at this moment that Jesus in John 6, or you, you're, an Isra, you, you're from the Israelite nation, we're going to wrap it up. You, you're aware of the story, right? Because someone, your, your buddy has literally just said, like, come on, Jesus, our fathers had bread and quail. The Jews even had a fable. They had this idea that Jeremiah, at the destruction of the temple, had taken some of the manna and hidden it. And then when the Messiah came, he would provide manna. So there was even deep prophecy in the book of Jeremiah, in the account of Jeremiah, saying that some manna will appear. And so these people are saying to our Lord, you did a great miracle yesterday. Now what we want is the big one. The bread from heaven every day kind of miracle. And do you know what they're missing? Jesus. Right in front of them. There had been a miracle the day before, but that miracle was not enough. They literally are coming from a miracle, and they are wanting their next miracle. And they are treating the Father and Jesus in this way. And so do we not do the same thing? Do we not respond in this way, unfortunately, to God's generosity? I'm not here to guilt trip you. I'm just hoping that Jesus, through this text, can lift our eyes to, to, the, to the spiritual bread, right? Not the things that we come to Him for. And so we say, God, if we can just have another miracle, if you would just do something else for me today, and we forget what He has already done in our lives, we forget. And so one of the reasons, for example, why David had, had so much power, and there was power to David's life and how he lived before God was because he had not forgotten. He had not forgotten what God had done. David did not forget what the Lord had done. The Psalms attest to it. And when he faced the lion and the bear, and, when he, and, and the, the Old Testament attests to this, when he faces the lion, when he faces the bear, remembering what God had done is the thing that gave him the courage to face Goliath. So how, maybe you've got a Goliath, maybe there's a mountain, maybe there's a something, whatever Christianese metaphor we can think of right now. Maybe there's something very difficult, very real for you, that's ahead of you. Outside of remembering God, that thing is going to become the Everest of your imagination. The way that that thing shrinks is through mustard seed-like faith, is through a remembering Okay, and so throughout the word, God calls his people to remember. Remember, O Israel, the Lord your God. Remember, 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 remember me. And this, after, this evening in intercession, I really felt like that was the, the invitation from Jesus. There was, this, there was this upwelling of prayer to say, remember. Remember that we are of a different kingdom. Remember, and, 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 and Christian brought the word, as he led intercession in, his, in, in, in Revelation 2, remember your first love. Remember what it was like to meet Jesus, to encounter him for the very first time. And I want to say to some of you tonight, maybe, maybe you something, there's something of the divine in what you are experiencing here. If you're new to what it means to do church or to visit here, maybe there's something of what God has or, or, or your conception, your idea of Jesus, of God. Maybe there's something... It's almost like lights are coming on, maybe for the first time. There's like, you, you, you sort of sense that lights are switching on. There's something, you're remembering something. Something that maybe is not of human memory, but is a deep remembering from a deep knowing that there's something more than this. 
And so Jesus realizes the crowd needs correction. He says to them, truly, truly, and this is the scripture, verse 32, he says, it was not Moses. It was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven. He's generous to remind them. He says, guys, I had to just correct you quickly. Moses didn't do the miracle. The father provided all that Moses and the team needed. And he says, it was not Moses, but my father gives you the true bread of heaven. For the bread of God is he, the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Again, he is saying, guys, the bread of God, the real bread is he who comes down from the father as manna came down from the father. And we can hand out the, the communion elements, please. Uh, can I ask the team that's serving? So I just remember that that needs to happen. He's saying, just as manna came down from heaven, he's saying, God is sending down from heaven. Stay here, stay here. We're almost there. Not you, you guys can go, but the rest of us stay here. The crowd sort of is understanding what Jesus is saying, but he's also, they're kind of not. They're not, still not getting it. And, and they sort of like, again, flippantly say to him, sir, give us this bread always. Like, give us this bread then. Okay. Like you're saying there's this bread that we don't know about. Please give us this bread. There are seven great I am statements in the book of John. I'm not going to go through all of them. I am the bread of, I am the bread of life. Say another one. I am the true vine. I am the door. Okay, I am the shepherd. I'm going to say all of them. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And here in verse 35, he says, I am. He follows their question. He says, I am the bread of life. He's saying, whoever comes to me shall not hunger. And whoever believes in me shall never thirst. What a statement. I am the bread of life. What? Jesus was born in Bethlehem, the house of bread. Prophesied hundreds of years by Micah before that. The word became flesh, and here's the thing. We broke it. There is no coincidence about that either. God knew that that's what needed to happen, that Jesus must be torn on a cross, his body like bread broken for us, so that we might know him. He prophesied years ago about a bread of life, someone who would come and be broken for our behalf. And there are so many similarities between manna and Jesus, bread and Jesus, the bread of life. The manna is almost like white fallen snow. Jesus is the lamb without blemish. Right? Or imperfection. Manna was super accessible. You wake up, food. Can you imagine? That was one of its main virtues. Its main thing was the fact that it was super accessible. He didn't even say like, okay, every day Israel, go hike 30 kilometers to that mountain. There you will find peaches and oranges and some water. He says, okay guys, I'm going to make, my, I'm going to make provisions accessible for you. And so here's the thing, like manna though, we can either tread on it, or we can take it up. So scripture says Jesus can either become a cornerstone, is a cornerstone, and can either be the thing that the stumbling block, the thing that we fall over, or how we respond and how we respond to him makes all the difference. Jesus is the bread of life, he is our sustenance. And verse 35 says that those who come to Christ will not hunger, will not hunger, and he who believes in him will never thirst. Apart from Jesus, nothing satisfies. Uh, I'm going to butcher this. James K. A. Smith says something like, I think it's him. He says, is it, it's not him. Is it possible that our, this was in, in our conversation, maybe you can help me, but is it possible that our most our most obvious desires are maybe not our deepest ones or the most our most common our most e evident the most 
Is it possible that our strongest desires, that's better, thank you. Is it possible that our strongest desires are maybe not our deepest ones? Not sure who said that. C.S. Lewis, I love how he sees this. He says, I cannot find a cup of tea which is big enough or a book that is long enough. And so in some, something simple, he speaks to the eternal. Okay, I realize now that we, this is where we must wrap up. In, in a poem by Diedrich Bonhoeffer, in his third stanza, this is a guy that died in the Nazi concentration camps. He, he says, should it be ours to drain the cup of grieving? Even the dregs of pain at thy command, will, we will not falter, thankfully receiving all that is given by thy loving hand. This was a man who was full of Jesus and who was satisfied. And what a stark contrast with the pathetic, sorry for the lack of better words, the pathetic millionaire on the Riviera. That's maybe a very strong word. The sad man, it's not pathetic, it's very sad, actually. So I don't know why I wrote that. Um, I was maybe angry because we're missing Jesus here. <laughs> Please forgive me. Um, God, says, God says through the prophet Isaiah, Isaiah 55, verse 1 to 3, says, Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And he who has no money, come. Buy and eat. <laughs> Buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread? And your labor for that which does not satisfy. Listen diligently to me and eat what is good. And delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me here that your soul may live. Jesus is making the same claim here in John 6.35. As Isaiah, Isaiah made, he's saying, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. And then we're going to miss out scene two, so we'll do a part two at some point, okay? Yeah? Yeah? Where Jesus gets into all the, if you want to be my disciple, if you want to follow me, you must eat of my flesh and drink of my blood. I don't think we, it's too much for one evening. James Boyce says this. I'm going to end here. As, as is, so here, I'm going, to, I'm going to just read this to you. You can close your eyes or you can read it on the screen. Is he as real to you spiritually as something you can taste or handle? Is he as much part of you as that which you eat? Do you not think, do not think me blasphemous when I say that he must be as real and as useful to you as a hamburger and french fries? I say this because he is obviously far more real and useful than these. The unfortunate thing is that for many people, he is much less. Is he substantially real to you? That is what is involved. That is, this is the, the, it's what's involved in treating him as the bread of life. To taste and see, to, to, to eat, to know. It's one of the divides of our souls is when we don't cross, cross here, the continental divides of the life of the soul. And it's where many of us flounder is where, we, where we, are, we do not take up that bread, but rather we trample. We, right? So I'll, I'll end with this. Joy Davidman in her book, Smoke on the Mountain, brilliantly comments on the first of the Ten Commandments that says in the New King James, thou shalt not have any other gods before me, right? And she sort of flips it and she says, and she turns it around, positively reading it, and she says, thou shalt have me. Thou shalt have me. What God is saying is, less so you shall not have other gods. He's saying you shall have me. He's saying both, right? So I'm but he's saying, I am. I am the bread of life. I am all that you need. Don't have other gods before me because I am what you need. I, thou, sh 
thou shalt have me. Okay, that is not an actual verse in the Bible for anyone who's going to panic. Don't panic. So this, this man, Morgan, Morgan, he did it all, but he, nothing satisfied him, right? And so the tragedy of, of his story is that if he had continued to flip through that Bible, that he had only ever read one scripture, and he maybe he would have landed up here in John. Maybe he would have read a bit more and not flippantly tossed it aside because it's just some more bread. Maybe Jesus would have, maybe Jesus through the text and through John or a different portion of text would have answered him and said, this is the work of God, the Father, that you believe in him who he sent. Okay. And so what does this have to do with division? I mean, division, provision. What does this have to do? It's a dividing matter. Okay. But we don't have to be divided about it. In fact, we are coming, that's the whole idea of communion is that we enter in together. So do you have your cup and your bread? Class Mena, thank you. So we're going to take of the bread. And we're going to take of the cup. But I think we do this flippantly because we treat, we treat Jesus and we treat God sometimes like the God that's just going to be at the next communion as well. So we've done communion many times. So we do not, we forget, we, we do not remember what it, mean, what it means to commune with God. And so when we do this flippantly, we actually, we, we trampling, we trampling on manna. We trampling on God's provision. Jesus is the provision of God. Amen. Jesus is the bread of life. Jesus is new wine. His life. And so I want you to, to really, it's, we have to fence the table. We have to say, like, guys, there's something about our heart posture here. Just as the crowds had a heart posture that was maybe a bit off, we just have to consider that maybe, maybe our heart posture is a little off. Like when we do this thing, when we come into community, when we come to worship God, when we come to recognize Jesus, maybe, maybe we're not always here for the right reasons. And I just want to say, maybe you feel a bit discouraged by that. I just want to say, God has made provision for that. Just as the, the, the Israelites grumbled in the desert, God still met them with generosity. He still provided for their need. And so he does that with Jesus. And, and when we drink, when we take and we eat and we remember, we remember not only that Jesus was slain on a cross for us, that he died for something, that he died that we might have life. And so maybe you can just close your eyes for a moment. We just, I think I just want to invite you to do business with the Lord. Like he alone knows, he discerns very clearly, very easily the posture of our hearts. He is not fooled. He's not made a, a mark. No one makes a mark of Jesus. So, Lord, we, um, I, just, I just consecrate even my, my heart posture now, Lord. Um, oh, so many are, the, many are the concerns of my heart, Lord. But thank you, Jesus, that you know. You know what lies deeper than what I can see, that what we can see in our own hearts. And so, Lord, we just come before you now, and we just posture our hearts before you. Say, so, Lord, won't you lift our eyes to the bread of life? Won't you, Father, come and help us to see the provision that is Jesus? We just say thank you, Father. Won't you just say thank you, Father, that you provided Jesus? Thank you, Father, that you provided in full everything that we could ever need and want in Jesus. John 16, 23 to 24 says this, In that day you will ask nothing of me, Jesus says. Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. 
Until now you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. And so what I want us to ask for this evening is simply Jesus. It's just Jesus once again. So I feel there's a dual invitation here. One to those who have never received Jesus, those who have never asked Jesus to come and be a part of their lives, of what it means to live here. And I want to ask, don't leave, don't, don't, flip, don't flip off another piece of bread. Don't throw away what is beautiful and, and, and provision for you. And then I, I want to say to all of us who have maybe taken this a bit lightly, so won't you ask Jesus again to come and make um, this material thing in your hand, this thing that you can feel? Something more in your heart. Something more. Jesus, we thank you that when we drink and take of the bread, Lord, when we drink of the wine, God, what we are doing is we are we are rewriting ourselves into your story. Not by our works, but by asking simply for Jesus. Lord, we thank you that through communion, through the bread and the cup, Lord, we are being restoried. We are being drawn back in. We are, we are placing ourselves back in reality. And so we pray this evening for the bread, Lord. We thank you for your body. We thank you that, Lord, you were broken for us. And, Lord, we, we realize that it was us who broke you. Our mess, our sin, our shame. And even though, Lord, we broke you, Lord, we thank you that you give your body to us. You don't shy away. You don't rip it out of our hands, Lord. In fact, you give yourself over unto death on a cross for our sake. And so, Lord, we consider this bread this evening. We consider what it means to be provided for by a Father. We thank you, Father God, for Jesus. When you're ready, you just take of the bread. And Lord, we thank you for the cup, the cup of the new covenant, Lord. We thank you that, Lord, because your blood was shed for us, we are no longer bound by the way that we, we are naturally in this world, Lord. But we, are, we have been paid, paid for supernaturally by your blood. And so we can live supernatural lives. We can come home. We can be at home within, our, within, your, within your presence, Lord. We can know you in fullness. And so we thank you, Lord, for your blood, which was shed not only for our freedom, but also for our healing. We drink now and remember. We remember Jesus. You say, take this in remembrance of me. We remember what you did on the cross. In Jesus' name. Yeah, will you stand with us? Okay. We went a little bit long this evening. But it's okay. This noch is sonnig noch op. Once you pass your cups, we just try to pass them to the aisle and then just be careful not to trap on them. <laughs> Don't step on the manor. Um I just, I think, in a personal sense, as I journey through this, I just am so grateful. I'm so grateful that God has given us His Word, that He has revealed Himself to us, that we don't have to live in a way that is... We don't have to continue to live in a fleshly way, in a way that is given over to the lusts. It says, um, 
the Bible says that they are those given over to their stomachs. And, and I just am grateful that, we, that as we eat, as we take of the bread of life, as we, as we eat of His Word, as we consume Him, things change because we are actually sustained. Okay, so we're going to worship Jesus. Phil is going to lead us. And then we're going to go across. There will probably be another coffee for another 10 minutes if the load shedding schedule is right. Um, but let's just worship together. And then we'll see you guys next week. We really hope that you have a fantastic week. If you need prayer, then please do make your way to the front. There will be some people to pray with you um, with something specific in this regard. All right. Let's worship. <laughs>